Thank you, Allison. Can you hear me out there? Thank you very much. So I started with Hewlett Packard 32 years ago. You need more volume. Thank you. So I started with Hewlett Packard 32 years ago in the 1G days. And over the course of that 32 years, the one thing I can say about this industry is that being successful means being very collaborative and working with the leaders in the industry. And that's what I'm gonna talk about today. So over the history of the universe, maybe just the history of the world, there's a lot of people that have made a name for themselves, individuals who've changed the course of history, like Leonardo, like Abraham Lincoln, like Isaac Newton, Anybody know this guy? John Daniel invented the battery. This is something you have in your pocket, every one of you. Winston Churchill, Chiang Kai-shek, and all of these folks are individuals we know as great leaders, but what's more important is that if you look a little deeper into their history, you'll find that they are leaders because they also had collaborations going on with many other people. There's more obvious collaborations out there like Louis and Marie Pasteur, like uh, Marie and Pierre Curie, who actually share a Nobel Prize. Uh, well, this guy didn't collaborate too much, but uh, he had people help him make movies. But how about Wilbur and Orville Wright? And of course, I think I mentioned at the beginning, uh, beginning of this talk, uh, Mr. Hewlett and Mr. Packard, collaborating together to start Silicon Valley. So this is what is important in this world. Uh, let's talk a little bit about 5G and why collaboration is so important. Does anybody know how many subscriptions exist in the cellular world today around the world? It's seven billion. That's about the same number as of people in this planet. And how much of that is covered by LTE today? It is 15%, right? Now that's still a billion, but it's evidence that LTE has a ways to go. We've got a lot of rollout still to do, and you see it happening every day. And that was actually mentioned in keynotes yesterday by some of the industry leaders. Let's take this a little bit further. How much energy does it take an operator to deliver one gigabyte? It's two kilowatt hours. And how many gigabytes do we consume every month in this world today? It's a big number, it's the biggest number, six exabytes, six times 10 to the 18th, and that is growing. So this industry is not green. We consume uh, perhaps as much as 2% of the world's power, and the industry needs to expand and make a denser network, which consumes even more power, and this is very expensive. So other challenges in the business are coming up. Now let's talk about capacity. There's a study on the largest train station in the world, Shinjuku in Tokyo. What is the active user density? These are people that are accessing their phones at any one time during rush hour in Shinjuku. It is 250,000 users per square kilometer. That's a lot. So do you think their data demand is gonna grow in the next five years? Is your data demand gonna grow in the next five years? Does anyone know the answer to this question? Everything except A. This is definitely going to happen. Think about it. In Shinjuku, if they all want 20 megabits per second, that's 5 terabits per second per square kilometer. That's a backhaul demand. That's a processing demand. These are big technology issues, capacity and so forth. A couple of other things, fun facts. How fast are we actually growing our data consumption? 5 terabits per year in the U.S. has now come to 5 terabytes every two days. A couple other things that are going on is massive change in the business models for the industry. Over-the-top revenues are now higher than access revenues, so that changes what operators think of in terms of how they're going to continue to make money. Most of the mobile data traffic is actually consumed indoors, both transmit and receive. So think about that. We spend a lot of money making this technology mobile, and most of the time we're using it while we're sitting down, inside, out of the rain. And the costs are growing. One gigabyte costs an operator about $10 to deliver. These are big numbers. And so we have a big challenge in front of us to add to the demand, to expand the use model, to make it affordable, to address 
other things. So we have power consumption and capacity issues we have to deal with. We have user perceived data rates, backhaul provisioning for these large crowds of people, and we all have to do it and make money. This is important for everybody here so we can continue to eat, and the business models are changing a great deal. So why should you collaborate? Why is this so important? Well, first of all, there's too much to do. It allows you to focus. It allows you to leverage the strengths of others. And actually, you learn a lot from each other. And that means that two people can do more together than they can separately. Think about great collaborators like Lennon McCartney, who got together and made amazing music. And frankly, I believe they did better separately than, or they did better together than they did separately. But it also enables you, and, and therefore, you know, you get two plus two equaling five sometimes. You also build early expertise and insight. You're able to be on time, which is necessary for this business. And you build credibility early with the world leaders. And that is very critical. This 5G world is extremely complex. It involves new semiconductor technology, new passive component technology, new air interface technology, radio wave, microwave, millimeter wave, antenna technologies, uh, UE design, CPE design, base station design, and network design, and it's all changing very dramatically. It is a huge, massive change in everything that we think of when we think of a 5G or 4G mobile network. There was a day when everything we needed to know about physics you could capture in one book. And that was felt to be true even up until the 14th century. Uh, Mr. Aristotle captured just about all of it in his treatise on physics. Well, today, if you want to understand all this, you need to know everything in multiple libraries. It is extremely difficult to stay on top of everything and to cover all of that territory no one person, no one entity, no one body can do it all. And that's why collaboration is so important. So here's a couple of examples of what we're doing that we're really excited about. And you'll see some of this on the floor today and a lot more in the press as, as days come. This started a year ago with the University of Bristol and a consortium here in Europe, Millimeter Wave Magic, MM Magic, where we're helping do channel sounding to understand the new air interface, to overcome the challenges for capacity and speed. Working together with companies like Acelsen, the demonstration right here, their beam forming is just down the road, and this is uh, just down the hallway here, and this is all about increasing capacity and decreasing power consumption. Work with Massive MIMO, more power consumption and capacity management issues, interference management issues, to go and address some of those problems I talk about. And this is with uh, China Mobile in, in China. More examples, work on phased array systems for higher frequencies, complex steerable antennas, once again, to take advantage of and leverage what we need to do in millimeter wave. This work. Uh, is being done with Southeast University in China, one of the primary applied research areas for wireless on the planet. Then we also work with commercial entities like Skyworks, where we worked very closely to work on li amplifier linearization techniques, which decrease power consumption in base stations and mobiles. And did I talk about power consumption? It's expensive. So how do you do this? This was digital pre-distortion work that we did at Millimeter Wave, which is uh, at least one technique to help decrease what's going on in terms of power consumption. More work in digital pre-distortion and amplifier linearization with the University of Waterloo. More work on phased array radars with the University of California in San, Di San Diego, where we're working on how much of a uh, distance you can get out of these systems. Um, and then work with China Mobile, which we've done for the last several years in the 5G space, uh, that involves work on centralized RAN, that involves research into MIMO technologies with their smart tile technology, and most recently in millimeter wave technologies with channel sounding and uh, amplifier linearization. This is a map of the things that we can talk about. The public version of the collaborations that we're doing. And I just use it to show that we're involved around the world. This is a global business. That should be obvious as you walk around this floor. 
It means working with different kinds of entities. It means working with universities. It means working with government research organizations. It means working with commercial entities. And it means working with consortia around the world on a range of different technologies. And this is one of the most exciting parts about collaboration is how much you can learn and leverage given the work that we're doing around the world. And lastly, I'll give a highlight of one other thing, not just physical measurements, but also what's happening at the application layer. This is an example of research we're doing to do validation of applications. Are they doing what they need to do? Are they going to meet the user's need? And is there a way we can build a certification process around applications uh, in the, either within the UE space or in the base station and networking space with an exciting uh, uh, collaboration project that we're doing based here in Europe we call Triangle. So these are just some examples. There's a few more that you will read about in the press here, or you can see around the floor. We announced that we're working with Samsung on making measurements on their pre-5G CPE uh, based on the Verizon standard. And uh, there's several others, work we're doing with Huawei, work we're doing with CTE. So these are just examples of a couple of things I'll highlight in this last picture. So I'm a musician when I'm not an engineer. And I'll say that the best times I've had and the best performance I have is when I work with people that are better than I am, when I'm sitting next to the leaders and playing up to them. And that's a big important part of this, which is working with the industry leadership and establishing uh, what needs to happen as we move forward from research and development into actual trials and end-to-end -end testing. So you could do more together, and harmony is almost always better than solo, and we welcome other collaborations, and I encourage everyone to think about what it takes to make these things work better and to get two plus two to actually equal five. Thank you very much.